Chapter 1, Teaching in Parables In Christ's parable teaching, the same principle is seen as in his own mission to the world. That we might become acquainted with his divine character and life, Christ took our nature and dwelt among us. Divinity was revealed in humanity, the invisible glory in the visible human form. Men could learn of the unknown through the known. Heavenly things were revealed through the earthly. God was made manifest in the likeness of men. So it was in Christ's teaching. The unknown was illustrated by the known, divine truths by earthly things with which the people were most familiar. The Scripture says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Matthew 13, verses 34 and 35. Natural things were the medium for the spiritual. The things of nature and the life experience of his hearers were connected with the truths of the written word. Leading thus from the natural to the spiritual kingdom, Christ's parables are links in the chain of truth that unites man with God and earth with heaven. In his teaching from nature, Christ was speaking of the things which his own hands had made and which had qualities and powers that he himself had imparted. In their original perfection, all created things were an expression of the thought of God. To Adam and Eve in their Eden home, nature was full of the knowledge of God, teeming with divine instruction. Wisdom spoke to the eye and was received into the heart, for they communed with God in his created works. As soon as the holy pair transgressed the law of the Most High, the brightness from the face of God departed from the face of nature. The earth is now marred and defiled by sin, yet even in its blighted state much that is beautiful remains. God's object lessons are not obliterated. Rightly understood, nature speaks of her Creator. In the days of Christ, these lessons had been lost sight of. Men had well nigh ceased to discern God in his works. The sinfulness of humanity had cast a pall over the fair face of creation, and instead of manifesting God, his works became a barrier that concealed him. Men worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator. Thus the heathen became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Romans 1, 25 and 21. So in Israel, man's teaching had been put in the place of God's. Not only the things of nature, but the sacrificial service and the scriptures themselves, all given to reveal God, were so perverted that they became the means of concealing him. Christ sought to remove that which obscured the truth. The veil that sin has cast over the face of nature, he came to draw aside bringing to view the spiritual glory that all things were created to reflect. His words placed the teachings of nature as well as of the Bible in a new aspect and made them a new revelation. Jesus plucked the beautiful lily and placed it in the hands of children and youth, and as they looked into his own youthful face, fresh with the sunlight of his Father's countenance, he gave the lesson, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, in the simplicity of natural beauty. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet, I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Then followed the sweet assurance and the important lesson. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. In the Sermon on the Mount, these words were spoken to others besides children and youth. They were spoken to the multitude, among whom were men and women full of worries and perplexities and sore with disappointment and sorrow. Jesus continued, Therefore, 
Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Then, spreading out his hands to the surrounding multitude, he said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew six twenty-eight through 33 Jesus Christ interpreted the message which he himself had given to the lilies and the grass of the field. He desires us to read it in every lily and every spire of grass. His words are full of assurance and tend to confirm trust in God. So wide was Christ's view of truth, so extended his teaching, that every phase of nature was employed in illustrating truth. The scenes upon which the eye daily rests were all connected with some spiritual truth, so that nature is clothed with the parables of the Master. In the early part of his ministry, Christ had spoken to the people in words so plain that all his hearers might have grasped truths which would make them wise unto salvation. But in many hearts the truth had taken no root, and it had been quickly caught away. Therefore speak I to them in parables, he said, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Matthew 13, verses 13 through 15. Jesus desired to awaken inquiry. He sought to arouse the careless and impress truth upon the heart. Parable teaching was popular and commanded the respect and attention not only of the Jews but of the people of other nations. No more effective method of instruction could he have employed. If his hearers had desired a knowledge of divine things, they might have understood his words, for he was always willing to explain them to the honest inquirer. Again, Christ had truths to present which the people were unprepared to accept or even to understand. For this reason also he taught them in parables. By connecting his teaching with the scenes of life, experience, or nature, he secured their attention and impressed their hearts. Afterward, as they looked upon the objects that illustrated his lessons, they recalled the words of the divine teacher. To minds that were open to the Holy Spirit, the significance of the Savior's teaching unfolded more and more. Mysteries grew clear, and that which had been hard to grasp became evident. Jesus sought an avenue to every heart. By using a variety of illustrations, he not only presented truth in its different phases, but appealed to the different hearers. Their interest was aroused by figures drawn from the surroundings of their daily life. None who listened to the Savior could feel that they were neglected or forgotten. The humblest, the most sinful, heard in his teaching a voice that spoke to them in sympathy and tenderness. And he had another reason for teaching in parables. Among the multitudes that gathered about him, there were priests and rabbis, scribes and elders, Herodians and rulers, world-loving, bigoted, ambitious men, who desired above all things to find some accusation against him. Their spies followed his steps day after day to catch from his lips something that would cause his condemnation and forever silence the one who seemed to draw the world after him. The Savior understood the character of these men, and he presented truth in such a way that they could find nothing by which to bring his case before the Sanhedrin. In parables he rebuked the hypocrisy and wicked works of those who occupied high positions, and in figurative language clothed truth of so cutting a character that had it been spoken in direct denunciation, they would not have listened to his words, and would speedily have put an end to his ministry. But while he evaded the spies, he made truth so clear that error was manifested, and the honest in heart were profited by his lessons. Divine wisdom, infinite grace, 
were made plain by the things of God's creation. Through nature and the experiences of life, men were taught of God. The invisible things of Him since the creation of the world were perceived through the things that are made, even His everlasting power and divinity. Romans 1 verse 20, the Revised Version. In the Savior's parable teaching is an indication of what constitutes the true higher education. Christ might have opened to men the deepest truths of science. He might have unlocked mysteries which have required many centuries of toil and study to penetrate. He might have made suggestions in scientific lines that would have afforded food for thought and stimulus for invention to the close of time, but he did not do this. He said nothing to gratify curiosity or to satisfy man's ambition by opening doors to worldly greatness. In all his teaching, Christ brought the mind of man in contact with the infinite mind. He did not direct the people to study men's theories about God, His Word, or His works. He taught them to behold Him as manifested in His works, in His Word, and by His providences. Christ did not deal in abstract theories, but in that which is essential to the development of character that which will enlarge man's capacity for knowing God and increase his efficiency to do good. He spoke to men of those truths that relate to the conduct of life and that take hold upon eternity. It was Christ who directed the education of Israel. Concerning the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Deuteronomy 6, verses 7 through 9. In his own teaching, Jesus showed how this command is to be fulfilled how the laws and principles of God's kingdom can be so presented as to reveal their beauty and preciousness. When the Lord was training Israel to be the special representatives of himself, he gave them homes among the hills and valleys. In their home life and their religious service, they were brought in constant contact with nature and with the word of God. So Christ taught his disciples by the lake, on the mountainside, in the fields and groves, where they could look upon the things of nature by which he illustrated his teachings. And as they learned of Christ, they put their knowledge to use by cooperating with him in his work. So through the creation we are to become acquainted with the Creator. The book of nature is a great lesson book, which in connection with the scriptures we are to use in teaching others of his character and guiding lost sheep back to the fold of God. As the works of God are studied, the Holy Spirit flashes conviction into the mind. It is not the conviction that logical reasoning produces, but unless the mind has become too dark to know God, the eye too dim to see Him, the ear too dull to hear His voice, a deeper meaning is grasped, and the sublime spiritual truths of the written word are impressed on the heart. In these lessons, direct from nature, There is a simplicity and purity that makes them of the highest value. All need the teaching to be derived from this source. In itself, the beauty of nature leads the soul away from sin and worldly attractions and toward purity, peace, and God. Too often the minds of students are occupied with men's theories and speculations, falsely called science and philosophy. They need to be brought into close contact with nature. Let them learn that creation and Christianity have one God. Let them be taught to see the harmony of the natural with the spiritual. Let everything which their eyes see or their hands handle be made a lesson in character building. Thus the mental powers will be strengthened, the character developed, the whole life ennobled. Christ's purpose in parable teaching was in direct line with the purpose of the Sabbath. God gave to men the memorial of his creative power that they might discern him in the works of his hands. 
The Sabbath bids us behold in his created works the glory of the Creator. And it was because he desired us to do this that Jesus bound up his precious lessons with the beauty of natural things. On the holy rest day, above all other days, we should study the messages that God has written for us in nature. We should study the Savior's parables where he spoke them, in the fields and groves, under the open sky, among the grass and flowers. As we come close to the heart of nature, Christ makes his presence real to us and speaks to our hearts of his peace and love. And Christ has linked his teaching not only with the day of rest, but with the week of toil. He has wisdom for him who drives the plow and sows the seed. In the plowing and sowing, the tilling and reaping, he teaches us to see an illustration of his work of grace in the heart. So in every line of useful labor and every association of life, he desires us to find a lesson of divine truth. Then our daily toil will no longer absorb our attention and lead us to forget God. It will continually remind us of our Creator and Redeemer. The thought of God will run like a thread of gold through all our homely cares and occupations. For us, the glory of His face will again rest upon the face of nature. We shall ever be learning new lessons of heavenly truth and growing into the image of His purity. Thus shall we be taught of the Lord, and in the lot wherein we are called, we shall abide with God. Isaiah 54:13 and 1 Corinthians 7, verse 24.